Dwight Hellion um, is a poet. And of course, a poet who is a vocalist, a reader, an intellectual, an artist, a visual artist, a sound artist. And uh, the front of the band Integrity, which is a band I've listened to since the mid 90s, um, and if you know or understand that time in music, which was an intensive and interesting time in music, uh, I'd hope you'd agree with me that he's kept it real. Um, I should say that I'm probably more fond of subculture, hardcore, hardcore punk rock, metal uh, from the sort of underground or subculture world uh, at, at this period of time because that's the world that I sort of formed my ideation of the world of, of expressive art and uh, the practices and the methods and the experience of technology at that time and creating art I think is a window into how to keep art uh, actually more human, <laughs> if that makes sense. But, uh, you know, in saying that, um, my intention here is to talk about poetry and popular culture, which selecting Dwight Hellion is kind of uh, a, a contrast to some, some of the to people like Lane Staley or uh, um, Jeff Buckley. Uh, who, as I said in the Jeff Buckley one, I, I didn't really listen to him. Um, and in, in terms of, of Lane Staley, I, I like their music. I mean, I was an Alice in Chains fan um, as a kid. Uh, but anyway, Dwight, Dwight Hellion uh, comes from, you know, the underground, really. And there's a great interview in Decibel Magazine um, from 2017 by Neil Jameson, um, a really good and insightful interview uh, about Dwight and where he's at. I don't know what he's doing these days. Um, looks like he's doing some uh, collaborations, but unlike the other two poets that I've discussed, he's still alive. So uh, that kind of but he, he's reached such a point in his life, I think, that he's really come into the, we can, we can see that there is a, uh, a very strong and resilient artist here. Um, I, I'd like to actually touch on the Decibel article a bit um, and, and, and really encourage you to read it. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, Dwight really understands where he's at. Um, you know, he says some things that, that, like, making music and artwork is a great way to distract myself from the real world and its trapping sometimes an escape is necessary and inviting. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty telling statement that, you know, creating art is a way to escape. Um, and I have mixed feelings on this, uh, whether it's an escape or not. And I think he hints at, at this, this idea. Basically, the concept here is that um, in our artwork, there is something of our thoughts that are left to the world and the things we do in a certain, a certain way. Uh, if we harm someone or do good to someone in a way in their, their, their mind and experience, there's something of us left with them as it's a shaping sort of thing, right? Uh, and, and so it's not an escape in the sense that, only in the sense of his attention to the world around him, right? that this is a kind of uh, a place where he can articulate and, and reveal things to himself which are profound, right? And, and this is the thing about an artist. I, I, think, I think everybody needs to, to do art, <laughs> you know? 
but it's some people who have who who got it right and keep doing it and and help us uh, to to remember that. Um, but this part of the interview, he's talking about um, arcane and forbidden knowledge that he was always interested in, uh, and that he likes to read occult of occult and religious themes. And he does mention the Old Testament. He reads the Old Testament. His comments on the Old Testament are actually pretty interesting. We'll get to those, I hope. Um, and he talks about how you know reading gets into his music, artworks, and lyric. Um, he says some really, actually, quite intellectual stuff, I think. The material world is in a constant state of flux. Uh, more so than now, he's talking about musicians and artists who are trying to push their agenda. Um, and he talks about this as a type of uh, deception, that there are some people who, who have a genuine sense of altruism or civic duty, and others that are opportunist and want to exploit and manipulate people. Um, he also talks about, you know, he's not really political. And I, I agree, right? I, I think uh, he says, I have no political aspirations. I'm not trying to save the world. I am content with watching the world eat itself, um, <laughs> which I think is pretty revealing. Uh, uh, is this a nihilistic thought or, uh, or what? Um, is this his real conviction? Uh, does he really, is he really content with the world watching, watching the world eat itself? Uh, I don't think, I don't think so, but I mean, it's his life, his thoughts, but I think just by getting the sense here that that's kind of the posture he has to take as a performer. That's a persona, right? And he definitely had, was a persona in the, uh, the late eighties and, and through the nineties, you know, as someone like, wow, look at that guy, you know? got some muscles, wearing some hardcore fashion of the time, which is like jerseys and stuff, short hair, gloves, power, you know, power and strength and, and all of the, the, the values that hardcore was espousing. Um, it's a persona, right? But it, it's also something you would believe in. I am content with watching the world eat itself. Um, okay. But uh, the follow-up question is, well, where have we gone wrong? And, and what he says is interesting. I think human society has always been going wrong, <laughs> entirely wrong. It's been a quite, quite a long and utterly successful fall. And if you're familiar with his, his themes and his lyrics, and you'll see this all the time, I, he goes on, I admire its dedication to self-destruction. The end of the world exists for every generation in humanity's history. It will always be the end times. Destruction always breeds rebirth and endings always usher in beginnings. So, of course, this, this interview is around howling for the nightmare shall consume. And perhaps we're seeing the persona really into his, his thesis. But uh, a poet is, is a, a, a collection of personas in a way, right? Or they create a persona or a multiple different poets. They can, they can do that. Or they can be extremely lyrical uh, truth, so true and so honest that uh, you can't escape it. So I'm not trying to discredit uh, Dwid here uh, at all. I'm just trying to figure out what kind of, of lyric poet uh, he might be um, in order for us to appreciate or evaluate or assess his, his lyrics. Um, so if you think human society has always been going wrong, entirely wrong, it's uh, quite a long and utterly successful fall and that it's dedicated self-destruction um, and then remark on the end of the world that exists for every generation and that it'll always be the end times. Yes, definitely, clearly. Um, that destruction brings rebirth, and this is the alpha and the omega and the margins, right? So here we have a, a, a position, right? He's looking at it from, from that fall, that continual fall. And, and of course, when we talk about end times and beginning times, we're always still talking about time, time itself. So this is a, a, a poet who is 
a view of human society is articulating that vision of hell on earth, of how humanity is the devil, right? In a way, right? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, he also talks about, and I find this interesting too, Robert Johnson sold his soul, selling his soul to the devil um, long before anyone thought of heavy metal. So he's getting into the roots of heavy metal. Uh, he talks about the purity and misery of the blues had set the bar for all metal music that would follow. As for art, I would say when art does not evoke the most sacred and personal of emotions from the depths of its creator, then that art is usually just a simple shallow blur existing without substance, without a soul. You must infuse your soul into your work, using it as a bridge to escape the flesh prison and its confines. This is gospel. This is transcending the flesh. Take, for example, the Lomax field recordings of imprisoned chain gangs. Their music is purity. It is salvation. Now, that's quite a bit, right? But I think he's giving you one of his more refined... Um, he's now talking about himself as an artist, whereas... Earlier, you know, he's kind of still in persona mode. Um, but to infuse your soul into your work, I, 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 I find that really, really interesting. Uh, he, he said a few times about this black and whiteness uh, as well, right? He doesn't like polarities like that, um, which also works with this sort of beginning and ending. He doesn't really like politics uh, or to identify with politics. And he's really looking at the feeling, the, the intensity of the art, which is what an artist should do. Uh, this isn't a matter of, uh, of uh, privileged groups or politics or the hegemon versus the oppressed, right? This is really um, a, higher, a higher understanding or let's say a deeper understanding of one's um, artistic production, um, which I respect. Uh, because there's not enough of that these days. And I think going back to something I had mentioned earlier is really, really important uh, to note that the transition that subculture, uh, underground culture, hardcore radical music made in the 90s to social media, uh, Napster, Friendster, what, all these things that had come up changed the way people thought. Uh, change the way people make and to me that that has to do with the soul as well right that uh, that uh, um, how one looks at themselves or reflects of themselves with the things they make you can have an Instagram influencer making a post and seeing themselves in the world it's like a, a digital mirror right when you're Dwid, growing up in Indiana and seeing cornfields, and how he, how he admits that, yes, I had nothing really, <laughs> and I just created my own worlds with paper and, you know, pencil or whatever I had. I think there's something very intense and very true about that. The means to create something, I think, characterize underground subculture, hardcore, hardcore punk rock, all of that music uh, that I was part of in the Midwest as well, you, you, you become resourceful. Um, you begin to embrace the sort of um, unintentional lo-fi <laughs> results, but you form communities and it does not exist in mass culture, uh, in popular culture. Uh, but now you could say that everything has a sort of uh, popular potential in a ways that it never did. So when we talk about the soul um, and access to what per perhaps the soul is, clearly he's thought about it. Um, I don't know what flesh prison and its confines might mean, but I find that quite interesting. Uh, I think I get it.
But again, as for art, I would say when art does not evoke the most sacred and personal of emotions from the depths of its creator, then that art is just usually just a simple shallow blur existing without substance, without a soul. And indeed, most of the popular mass content, I don't think has a soul at all. Um, and I don't really think that, uh, I think we will see as time goes on that a lot of digital art made by computers and machines itself with really less human beings in part of, in, in the part of the process of imposing constraints on it, right? So you're not even telling the machine what to do. You'll see what life without a soul looks like. I really think we'll see this. I think we will. And I think he's, he's onto this as well. Partly because of the time he, he, he begins to get his first impressions of what it means to create worlds, right? I'm not saying that new artists get, don't do this or don't think this. I'm just saying that he does and he has particular authority with it. Um, I think I've spent quite a time on quite a bit of time on this article. Uh, and I want to get to his lyrics. Um, he talks about painting. Um, he talks about philosophy and sermon conversation and storytelling in his albums of exercising and exorcising his soul. Um, he goes on, I do not expect the answers to life's mysteries to reveal themselves so easily, though I would be ecstatic to find those answers before my death. I am resolved to chase. I'm resolved to the chase and know the catch, that the catch itself is something far beyond my grasp. I continue the hunt within the darkness until the forest relents itself to the light. Rather poetic. Rather poetic. There is no hope for escape, right? He also says uh, something uh, that's quite interesting. Um, he's a big fan of Danzig. I'm also a fan of Danzig. Uh, Glenn Danzig in particular. Uh, we won't go there, but I think that's another poet, I believe. Quite good lyrics, quite an amazing imagination. But yeah, I agree with the author here. He's not coasting on his past achievements. He's pushing forward. And uh, artists like this will never be um, hailed in the sort of elitist lexicon of mass American popular culture, unfortunately, right? They will never be examined for their intellectual depth. They're not politically correct or pre-made for that, uh, but they definitely need to be considered, right? Um, okay, that's some quite a bit of context. Uh, I wanted to take a look at uh, the album To Die For from 2003. And uh, I'll just read the, the first poem. I'm going to call it a poem, Taste My Sin. Lies driven incision through the cross of forbidden man. I stricken pure religion carry on in the forgotten land. Time can't release everything that you see. Fear as your days turn to night, demons come to life. You could never taste my sin. Lies driven incision through the cross of forbidden man. Time has captured my life to do what must be done. Feel it breaking, come on, butchered bleeding, swollen, seeping, a cross too great to bear, enslaved vision, betrayed religion, forsake all those who believe, breathe, final gasp. Okay, we know this is going to be dark, but let's just kind of forget about all of that. Uh, 
there is a, a poet here, right, who is giving, as Duid might have said, a sermon. Um, there, but there are also philosophical elements in here. Um, lies driven incision through the cross of forbidden man. Eye stricken pure religion carry on in the forgotten land. Time can't release everything that you see. Fear as your days turn to night. Okay. Time can't release everything that you see. Now in the article, of course, this is very much about time. Uh, when we were talking about soul, but also the beginning and the end, humanity's constant fall, its destruction, uh, which he enjoys. Uh, uh, what does this have to do with the soul? Well, time can't release everything that you see. So seeing here is a vision, not, not what is symbolic in, in of the visual perception, and not even that we confuse sound with, with things we see because we grow up in an audiovisual amalgam, right? Intensively with, with media. Time can't release everything that you see. So there is a certain uh, tension in time. Time has captured my life to do what must be done. Feel it breaking. Uh, so this might be, you know, simplistically, yeah, time is breaking. I find it interesting though. Uh, time has captured my life, but time can't release everything that you see. Uh, so there is a interesting uh, contemplation or maxim here on time. Time captures life, but it can't release. Uh, the third uh, track is Blessed Majesty, um, which is more of a, an illustration. Uh, about something about betrayal. I don't know what kind of, uh, I think it implies with the first few lines, dreams forgotten, lives lost long before angels' final war. Stole, stolen innocent, innocence kept within eternities. Serene screams, shapeless shadowed forms take flight upon blackened wings like a dream. Final light, fallen grace, blanketed belief all my life. I loved you, now you betray me. Loyal return deceived. And this is more like collage. Gets more into this collage. And, and Dwight had mentioned that, uh, you know, that was his real, his first intensive uh, sort of art form was collage. Um, probably good for lyrics, especially how he screams them and sometimes sings them and sometimes in a gravelly, crooning, semi crooning way. <laughs> Very rare. Uh, but here we have this idea of something kept within eternities, the plural of eternities, serene screams, shapeless shadowed forms. Um, this is a, of course, pretty good attempt at trying to articulate something which is absolute and eternal. Uh, we had just been considering time breaking open, time concealing, and then there is this sort of idea of understanding eternity and the contrast of serenity of screaming which in a way uh, we could visualize a type of intense light as a scream um, again we have to keep our mind open to the words and and what they might imply uh, and in order to get into perhaps the, the deeper parts of this persona's poetry um, Okay, he keeps going. Um, the seraphic storm. There's some other things that go on here. Uh, let's let's look at hatred of the world, which is the sixth song, uh, because I like the title. Let's see. Everything went away. Even I turned my back, back to the glory, the way it was, the way it should be. Feel it coming to its end. 
those days of parasites, days of loss, time to begin again, those days of fear, those days of hate when the world turned against us, for the music that we made, for the things that we said, we were hated of the world. I see through smiles of my enemies and I wait to watch their weakness shine through nothing. Will ever relieve the hate you instilled in me. You'll never learn. Let me burn. This is, I think, very lyrical. Uh, I think if this is Dwid himself in person, I think this is pretty close. We're not getting a sermon here. Uh, we're not really getting much of philosophy. We're not getting anything but something real. Um, this album, I chose this, this one for a few reasons because I think it's kind of recapping or, or going back to the hardcore days. Um, I think there was some kind of uh, fight that broke out when they tried to tour with this album and they, I think they just called it off. Um, there's, that's another sort of thing altogether, but uh, I think they were jumped by Nazi skinheads or something like this. This stuff happens in these kinds of shows. In hardcore, this this goes back. I mean, I've I've fought with racist skinheads before at shows. <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, okay, so um, let's look at "Burn It Down," the, the eighth one. Time has run out. I'm in hell. Let me burn your blood. The mirror, everything seems clearer. Your lies override everything. I can't believe a word you say. This is the last time I trust you. And it's the last thing I ever do. I'm going to make sure you never forget this. I'm going to make sure you always regret this. Look in my fucking eyes and tell me to believe. Don't you ever try and pull that shit on me. Grown cold, my heart is black. There's no turning back. Very lyrical. Uh, is it a poem? This is where poetry sort of falls into, I would say, emotion. So thinking about some of the things that Dewitt had said in his interview with Decibel, um, and the soul, of course, 15 years later, right? I think he's much more, I think his understanding has probably developed a lot more. And again, these are lyrics meant for music, not necessarily poetry. But I do see poetry here, I in particular, um, in the beginning, time has run out. I'm in hell, let me burn. Your blood, the mirror, everything seems clearer. Uh, which is also, seems real. It seems like a real thing. Uh, but then again, here I think the rage and the emotion sort of overtakes it. So it's a powerful lyric, but is it lyric poetry? Mm. I don't know. Good lyrics, though, for hardcore metal or whatever they're doing at this time. Uh, finally, To Die For. Um, I, I think this, this is one of those songs, too, that it's hard for people to understand uh, if you're not from it, but this is all we have. This is all we need. You better believe there's something to die for. We don't need you or your rules. This is ours. There's something to die for. We hear every word you say. Don't turn your back on us. Dive in the crowd, shout out loud, this is our town, there's something to die for. Black bandanas, black wristbands, this is our land, there's something to die for. We hear every word you say. Don't turn your back on us. Bringing back all the hate. We remember 88. Jordan's construction gloves, violet dancing in the scene we were proud of. Ban us from your fucking clubs, you can't stop us. It was 88. I don't think this is a Nazi reference. Uh, maybe it pissed off some Nazis. Uh, but, uh, I mean, they came out of the late 80s and their first uh, EP in Contrast of Sin, I think, is released in 89. Uh, but this is definitely what hardcore is like. Emotion uh, at the expense of sensitivity and feeling. Raw uh, territory, right? Claiming your area code coalescing around your values uh, and what is successful about some hardcore bands uh, from this time is that they 
uh, migrated uh, the, I would say, hatred for the world, uh, an embrace of dark sort of reality, the dark reality, into a kind of subject matter of the occult, subject matters which uh, reflect how they feel, alienated not only from the world but from scenes or certain other groups. And this is this kind of tribalism in a way. And I think it's really important to point this out. Uh, Dwight Hellion is, is uh, an icon, really, uh, at one time called the godfather of Cleveland hardcore. Uh, and if you don't feel this, if you listen to the song to die for, and you don't feel it, don't worry. <laughs> uh, it's a very intense and real, um, moment in time and, and, and underground politics, what, what would be the politics of the underground, I would say in the hardcore scene. And I, my purpose here in, in going over this is to try to get people to understand how that no, basically without institutions of what educational institutions really of established music industry, although of course they transition, uh, uh, integrity does and gets attention, right? But it gets ignored more or less as well. They really occupy the, Dwight Hellion's work really occupies and the musicians associated with them occupy, uh, this transition between uh, the underground, its politics, its thinking, the energy and emotion of the music into opening up into other subject matter, which can ex explicate the disdain and hatred and disgust for the world in which they see. Right. And I see in, in I guess I see in Dwid's comments later on in life that he's really thinking more deeply about things that have, that do exist in, in, in intellectual, uh, uh, culture, uh, which popular culture doesn't pay attention to, which universities and, and books and certain venues on, on, uh, YouTube or whatever would, would support. And he's doing it right. And he's doing it without their support. And this is what every hardcore kid, uh, of that wasn't a poser or didn't really feel it was just trying to fit in, which is fine. You can do that. That's cool. Everybody needs to, to poke around and see what they're interested in. But if you're called to this kind of thing and you understand what it is, then you'll be able to better admire why this might, some of this might not be poetry, but where it has gone to is definitely a win, uh, for those times and what that means. Okay. Now, uh, I don't want to make this too terribly long, but I want to get to some of his other lyrics, uh, which are more like poetry because he has a lot, he has a lot of content. Um, now I would say that the, the album, the blackest curse from 2010, uh, are very dark. Uh, there's some sermony preachy kind of things in here. And there's still this sort of, you can still hear the aesthetically. I like the album. I think it's a great album. The very dark, um, very dark moments. Let, let's look at take hold of forever, uh, which is the last one. Um, forever. Don't be fooled. My friend, there is no forever in life. This was something you never had a choice in deciding something created by powers that cannot be governed by any of man's rule for all things have a beginning and end and your cycle's end was complete when the crowns of sin conquered the weapons of salvation. The crowns of sin conquered the weapons of salvation. So <laughs> lies like incisions, right? The weapons of salvation. Thinking back to the first, uh, taste my sin, right? The weapons of salvation. Interesting. The only ones who get a forever are those that can manipulate time and not let it dictate to them. Only those who forsake life and embrace the unknown death that awaits us will know forever. So come my friend, deny a lifetime of waiting for something that will not come. 
take control of a real forever, take hold of the yin before it takes hold of you. Escape the prison of your life and enter the eternity of death. Take hold of forever. Wow, okay, the eternity of death. I don't think he's encouraging you to commit suicide. Not at all. Uh, I think here what we have is the, the that death is eternal. Um, and again, the the more philosophic uh, ceremony, philosophic aspect here is about time. Uh, salvation, time. Uh, that we're, that time can release. That time can reveal that there's eternities uh, within that, right? That, that we have a sense of this, that it's part of our vision or the power to see, uh, but we can't see everything. Um, and that death is, is what we would, perhaps it would force us to think something different about death. That death is the word we have for what we don't know. And that uh, it is an eternity. So there is a contradiction here. It, you should look at it, how it's, it's printed, at least on this website. Uh, I don't know the original intent of its structure, but it's, it's, it reads like a paragraph and all of them are like paragraphs. So somebody must have loaded it like this uh, or some machine did it, but I actually like the way it's, it looks here. So there's this, at any rate, there's this sort of paradox of, we think of death as the end, but we, us individually think of death as the end of me, right? But death is an eternity, right? In the breast of time, let's say. And that uh, uh, escape the prison of your life, the prison of your life, right? Being you, a poet understands that uh, maybe more sunshine poets, <laughs> do it is dark. Uh, understand uh, that, for, for instance, Fernando Pessoa understands uh, that there's a point which you have no feelings. And then when you return from that point of no feelings, you come back with a greater understanding of how feelings come into your thoughts uh, and how they come into others' thoughts and you can understand other personas. I see some of this very hard, uh, uh, rarefied understanding in Dwid's lyrics, actually. Um, surprisingly, I, I didn't, I know this song, I've heard it a hundred times, but I never bothered to look at the lyrics, only what I can make out of his voice, which is important. Voice is very important. He's very uh, interesting to listen to. Okay. Uh, invocation of the eternally coiling serpent. Long title, interesting. Um, for falling centuries, haunting in the shadow, night has gnawed her teeth against the throat of the seasons, invoking the serpent to awaken. Swallow humanity whole, freeing the binds placed upon them. Eternity passing glance, the judgment and deliverance lost for aeons, wandering, blind, long forgotten histories, mist. Brushed against, familiar scents stirred by echoes through blood memory. Eternally coiling serpent, deliver us from this torment. Awaken until the lingering madness drags us so far beneath your prayers that even darkness keeps her promise. Red like that, uh, red is kind of a collage as Dwid might like it, is really fun. Uh, quite an achievement actually. Again, I don't know if this is intentional to be printed like this. I'm looking at darklyrics.com. Uh, you can look at it if you want. Uh, Actually, it's kind of a challenge because before the world was young, um, I'm going backwards, but it's quite long. Uh, all right, I'm going to try it. Before the world was young, they held us so close, lost concept of humanity. We can never breathe again. The veil was placed within our minds, spreading perception, binding lies, resurrections, death on the branches of eternal hell. Damned, abandoned while redreaming the end, an awakened state, cowers before love's forever museum of the inoculated deception with a tortured pacing of hyenas, engines of iniquity tower overhead. This world shall always end. It has always come this end. 
We shall hold you in fearful comfort as the walls of reality dissolve from your viral existence, diseased awareness, hiding within the sharp angels of sabered fulfillment. Deliver my soul from this dark held flesh. Allow my promise to soar beyond heavens and telomeres, confined shouting against broken insects, disguised as prophecy, the moon's oracle, silhouettes and swallows, fast the shadows of our escape, salvation, decimation, extinction, crawling blind toward the elusive exit, exalted seeds of war, pillage and release the horror of majestic consummation. Glorify the great destruction. The days of obedience have long folded inward, revel in the defiant return of ancient cataclysm, drain their power over yours. Unconscious, undress, fawning, uncomfortable, eye contact, we are no longer dormant slaves. Humanity's heart shall decay and wield the key to unlock every desirable devastation. Escaping the heretical blood has saturated our world, long stolen history lies locked away. In cancerous vaults, I am empty, drained of division, flanked by teeth, barred degradation, shattered victims of history's final holocaust. Turn our weapon toward the south bestial boundaries, illuminate their darkness, unwind their deceptive violence. Ride forth, my blackened beast, ride forth into the conquered flames. May blood-soaked banners smolder to silken ash as we are delivered from humanity's blackest curse. We may, we shall unleash an avalanche of fire upon humanity's incarcerated corpse, scorched earth choking out life's final death, throes rising in a swirl of crushed awareness. Beneath a hooven claw, every cross in its place, every sword stained itself, pure darkness has kept her promise. Only in death shall we know love. Okay. <laughs> uh, it almost evokes its own music uh, when you read uh, poetry this way. Uh, and fun to read, a bit challenging. A bit challenging indeed. Uh, okay. I would like to move to uh, Howling for the nightmare shall consume and suicide black snake. Um, which are a lot shorter. Still some of the same type of theme. Let's go to uh, Howling for the Nightmare Shall Consume. Uh, hymn for the Children of the Black Flame. Our great darkness shall rise again, unleashing delivery, shackled beneath, corroded tombs forever, undying. For we are the children of the black flame. Is this a poem? Mm, it's a, definitely an illustration with poetic. Um, one particular poetic line, corroded tombs forever undying, which again is a kind of another way of saying eternity, right? Or this death of eternity, this eternal death, right? Um, we are the children of the black flame. I'm reminded again of some of the earlier themes of shapeless or form, shapeless shadows but a shadow is still the shape, so it's in a constant moving. It's not just nonsense, right? It's a way to express something which is greater than the words, uh, which again, I think, uh, is not necessarily soul, but feeling. Uh, is it soulful, though? I think maybe perhaps since Dwight is talking about his soul or a soul, to have soul, the soul is, of course, um, not the same thing as the spirit of the music. The spirit of the music is uh, counter culture, counter intuitive uh, to uh, mass culture. That's a spirit of it that I think is consistent, but the soul of it, of course, is this preponderance, perplexity, 
not only of disdain for the world, right? A soul is not the world. A soul is not the sum of what the world says, but it's the, the, the illumination into the world of something greater than the dumb world that Dwight sees us living in that's constantly destroying itself. That is the soulful thing. Uh, a view. So it does have soul, I think, in a way, reflective of a soulful understanding uh, and the spirit of uh, counterculture. Um, I am the spell. I am the spell. Sacrifice is serenity, the overwhelming whisper of annihilation, the cold lechery of spider dreams as winter's sun eclipses the shattered moon. Abandoning angels devour us, conjuring illusion, cauldron of lies born from the shadow of flickering fires. Blood on the edge of eternity, smoldering beneath ritual pyres. I think uh, the Children of the Black Flame here also relates uh, more like a poem. I actually like it. Um, the darkness of it, right? Uh, let's see if we can find something. Uh, Serpents of the Crossroad. There's a song on here, actually, I, I, quite a, I like quite a bit, and I like the title, String Up My Teeth. String up my teeth. We are the illusion. Siphon the night right out of your mind. Illuminated darkness. Salvation tangling its way back into focus. And we fight through the night where dreams turn on you. Cursed by suicidal laughter. Weaving a lace of fear into your heart. Religious Silence, descending sisters, transform the unknown, shivering sacrifice. Your hands brittle like the taste of swollen glass, falling through the spiral rolling shadows into the glorious abyss. Only in our name shall we hold the hissing destruction. The song is good too. I think actually it's really good. I think the song is really good because of the vocal complexity. It's still a bit off balance. Um, and just the variety of, of approach with the, with the musicians. So I, this one you can really, the lyrics too are also up pushing forward as well or, or stronger or just more there. Um, we are the illusion. What a great line to start with. Right, siphon the night right out of your mind, illuminated darkness. The, this is one way to describe the experience of soul. Salvation tang tangling its way back into focus, and we fight through the night, where dreams turn on you, cursed by suicidal laughter, weaving a lace of fear. We fight through the night where dreams turn on you. This is a very amazing line. We, you know, it's, 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 we, oh, those are my dreams. It's not a nightmare turning on you. It's the dream turning on you, right? Completely different vision of the soul and eternity, perhaps. Cursed by suicidal la laughter, weaving a lace of fear into your heart. Religious silence, descending sisters. There's so much going on here. Um, I suggest you read it again from darklyrics.com. Gal is, is most of his lyrics up there. Excellent. Let's take a look at one more uh, howling for the nightmare shall consume. The last vestiges of spiritual collusion, our covenant of lysanthropic indulgence, tearing off the flesh down to its feral base eviscerating everything in her name, howling for the nightmare shall consume, testify, speak in tongues, fill this room. There is a hand beneath the stars, sorry, there is a hand beneath the stairs, flooding into the flickering light that rolls itself through our minds, bellowing archetype, I can't find myself wrong, 
This is how I smell the rot, the pungent stench of dreams. Their thirst does resemble your blood. Parasite night screams in her lair. Like the raw flesh of seductive eyes, the elegant serenity of the twice-drowned sacrifice await in silence. She keeps her secret in the swamps of Rome, and this is where the devil comes through. Between me and you, we never had much of a chance. As hard as we tried to resist, we are always destined for this. We are always coming home. We are the hate that they created. It never leaves us. Well, I think uh, once more we have a bit of a glance back to those, those days in Cleveland uh, and the hate of the world. But we also have uh, quite an interesting <laughs> poem here. You know, I think one thing about reading poetry and, and, and discovering poetry, there are some poets that um, one should study. Uh, and there are certain fundamentals to the history of, of the knowledge of poetry and then poetry as a knowledge. Um, which is why, I mean, I learned this primarily through a few poets and my mentors, but without that basis, uh, that those fundamental understandings, we're apt to ignore the wealth and the beauty of the dark stuff and the beautiful stuff are interchangeable. In poetry, we're always dealing with uh, these opposites in their interactions and their, their fabrication. And uh, I just have a lot more respect for uh, Dwid uh, coming from hardcore and not giving up on his feeling, his soul, and allowing that conversation to be out there for the people who are still up to think. I, I say that too. It, it, this is a poem, a good poem, because this li lysanthropic indulgence. Then we end up in Rome, of course, Rome, Romulus uh, and Remus, uh, uh, which is the beginning of Rome as the, 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 what becomes the Roman Empire, um, and the, what the wolf means to Rome, and of course religion. Again, we have these ideas of uh, wow, the hand beneath the stairs. I said stars at first because a hand, there's a hand beneath the stars. That's neat too, but there might be a hand behind the stars would be even more cool, but he didn't write that. There's a hand beneath the stairs. A hand beneath the stairs. Let's think about that for a minute. Where does one need to be to understand there's a hand beneath the actual stairs perhaps they're walking on? What does it mean to be someone when you're walking up or down a plane on a, 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 even a terrace that there's a hand beneath the stairs. What does that hand look like? Is it poised open? Is it closed? Is it silent? Is it really big? I find that really quite interesting. I mean, amazing actually. It amazes me. I like that line a lot. Also, you know, the pungent stench of dreams, like when dreams turn on you, then the pungent stench of dreams. Parasite night screams in her lair like the raw flesh of seductive eyes. The raw flesh of, sed of seductive eyes. Huh. She keeps her secret in the swamps of Rome. And this is where the, the devil comes through between me and you. We never had much of a chance. Wow. Yeah, this is lyrical. Also fantastical with some illustrations, soulful, uh, and a poem. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think that's enough for now. I, I'm interested continually into it and, um, there's so much more to talk about here, but I think, I think that's enough. This is quite long. So long.